we see that the wild places are gone. We know the number of songbirds and butterflies has plummeted. We decide to turn our lawn into a garden, a garden filled with pollen and the plants caterpillars can eat before metamorphizing into butterflies. About then, we discover that our ornamentals are native to foreign countries, almost all of them. A butterfly searches for the plants she evolved with. Unless the butterfly finds her host plant, a chickadee mother will not find the 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars she needs to raise each clutch of baby birds. To put you on the path to having native plants for the moths and butterflies who make caterpillars for songbirds, we invite you to take a walk with us through Magruder Park with someone who can distinguish porcelain berry from grapevine, Dawn Taft. Ms. Taft is the arborist for the city of Hyattsville, Maryland. So here we have um, several invasives that you might find in your backyard. Um, this one here is Japanese silkgrass. This one is porcelain berry. And this one is a very familiar um, gill over the ground, ground ivy. Um, so the way you can tell Japanese stiltgrass is it kind of grows on a stilt. So if you see here, this is this is kind of the stilt, and then also a way to identify it is by the leaves. The center of the leaf is slightly off, and you can see that here at the back of the leaf. So that's Japanese stiltgrass. It's a pretty aggressive um, weed. Um, this one here. Is porcelain berry and the trick about porcelain berry is that it can be mistaken for a grapevine so there's a couple of different ways you can tell um, porcelain berry from a grapevine and maybe we'll find some some vines a little bit later but for right so here's a really good example of porcelain berry and how it can really take over your yard or um, the trees. Um, this vine here is porcelain berry and um, if it were a grapevine it would have a much peelier bark. Another way that you can tell that this is porcelain berry you see that uh, some of the leaves look just like a grape leaf. You see there. Uh, but if they have deep sinuses like we saw earlier, and these are just starting to uh, go into a deep sinus, um, that's a way that you can tell that it's porcelain berry. Um, the other thing we talked about earlier were these lenticels, and these are these little, little dots on the bark of, of the vine. Just these little bumps here. Um, are a way to identify this porcelain berry. Another thing is that these these berries here, if you see, in just a little bit of time, these will turn a blue, a porcelain blue, absolutely gorgeous color. Um, and that's a definite way to know that you have porcelain berry. And again, you'll see here that a grapevine would have a leaf that looks like this. And porcelain berry will have deeper sinuses. Let me see if I can find one. It really depends on the, the sunlight that gets to it. Now I'm not finding one. Oh, here we go you'll see the comparison of the two. That's great. Okay. All right. So this is our native grapevine, and this is one that we want to make sure that we keep 
So it's really important that if you're looking at invasive species in your backyard, that you make sure that you know that you're removing an invasive species. Um, sometimes it's even good to kind of look up look-alikes um, or how do you tell the difference between two different, two different um, species of plant. But this one, um, and it's hard to show the pith right now because these are dead, but these two are how close a grapevine and a porcelain berry vine are together. So this top vine is your grapevine. It has long furrowed strips that peel. The bark peel is very peely. And the uh, porcelain berry vine is much more, um, it's flaky, but it doesn't have these long furrowed strips like the, um, like the grapevine. So gill over the ground is one of the uh, other invasives that we were just talking about. And gill over the ground is, uh, it's called ground ivy as well. Uh, this one, um, quite aggressive. However, um, it's not one that we tackle much. Um, if you can see this here, um, this is gill over the ground. Um, and this one is, you'll find it just about everywhere. I think that um, it doesn't, it's not a bully. So even though it's aggressive and invasive, it will allow other things to grow through it, unlike the Japanese stilt grass and the porcelain berry, which will um, cover your plants and uh, crowd them out from the sunlight and kill them that way. I mentioned that um, things can grow through the creeping Charlie. Um, I know that's a problem with invasives, that they uh, shadow things and they can't grow. For instance, our native wildflowers like the trout lily that bloom in the early spring, they bloom in the early spring because that's when before our natives have leafed out. But invasives leaf out early, so we're losing our blood root and our trout lily due to the invasives. Yeah, I think that's a big, great point about invasives. And uh, one of the things that people don't realize invasives do is they, they crowd out our native species. And those native species are what feed our wildlife, our native wildlife. So when you take away the um, space for those trout lilies, there's some insect or some, some lizard, some invertebrate that's not getting the food source that it needs to uh, sustain our natural environment. I understand that it takes uh, six, this floored me, the numbers, 6,000 to 9,000 insects for a, a bird to raise a clutch of eggs. And 50% of that will be caterpillars of moths and butterflies. And you won't have the caterpillars if you don't have the native species. That's so we're talking bottom line here about losing our songbirds. Well, and whatever the songbirds are feeding, unfortunately. Yes. John, while we were walking along, I noticed this trunk and uh, this cluster of things growing up the base. Uh, is that mile a minute? So that is... That is mile a minute. Um, I have a piece of it here. Mile a minute is a pretty aggressive yard weed. Um, it is triangular in shape. Let me see if I can bring this up to you. This is triangular and I'm not sure if you can see, but they have tiny spines along the stem there. And so um, I, if, if you can see, it just kind of sticks to you and it'll, you'll get stuck up in it. Um, and so this one is climbing along the tree here. Um, mile a minute, a good one to get rid of. Um, above that, you'll see the three leaves. That is our native poison ivy, um, which uh, grows wonderful berries that really do a great job of feeding our wildlife. You just want to enjoy it from a distance.
Poison ivy is one of our natives, but you can tell the difference between the poison ivy vine and the English ivy vine, um, not only because this is much, much darker than the English ivy, but also if you look at the English ivy, the vines are much thicker, more noodle-ish like, where these, these um, hairs on this vine are just very fine. So the poison ivy is going to be um, much darker, the roots much darker, the, um, and the hairs on the vine much thinner, much finer than, um, than your um, English ivy vine. Um, but this, these are massive English ivy, I mean uh, poison ivy vines. And the other thing that you'll notice for poison ivy, um, if you want to know, is this poison ivy or English ivy? Um, it, when you look up, these poison ivy vines branch out and hang over like branches. Um, English ivy is going to stay stuck to your trunk for the most part. It might clump up and it might come out uh, maybe a couple of inches, but it does not branch like this. Know about poison ivy? Um, is that it gets beautiful white berries and they bloom so you can see here that they're the berries are starting to form they're green right now but they will bloom and then they will be um, a white a, a bright white color um, so yes poison ivy does have flowers and berries of course that's what feeds the wildlife how much harm is, is, is it doing to this tree? That's a good question, um, Sylvia. Um, so our um, English ivy um, is very detrimental because it does not, it doesn't die back. It's not a, a perennial per se. It's, it's, it's always uh, live and on the tree constantly growing. And so poison ivy doesn't harm the tree as much because it actually allows the tree to still grow um, because this will die back in the winter time. Um, and then uh, it allows the springtime for the leaves and the branches to get sun and to be able to see light before the ivy starts to branch out and grow. So that's the kind of difference between why English ivy is such an invasive and, and, and detrimental to the tree where uh, poison ivy is, is not as, as much of a hazard to the tree itself. Interesting. And this we have is multiflora rose, I believe. Actually, this one is a black raspberry. So multiflora rose, um, you will notice bracts. Multiflora rose will have bracts at the end, um, little hairy bracts, and um, uh, we'll see if we can find some. The thorns always face down, which these do, but this is totally, um, this sometimes people mistake for poison ivy because of the three leaves, but poison ivy won't have these claws on it, so this is a wild blackberry. Don't want to pull that up. It's Don't want to pull that. Fruit. You want to eat it. Here's a here's remnants of the fruit. Oh yeah. Somebody had a meal. Uh huh. So one of the things that you want to focus on when you're looking at invasives in your yard is that we want to try and remove invasives but replace them with native species. So here we have some um, beauty berry um, that we've planted um, and uh, you'll see a couple other uh, nests around. So the objective is to try and remove some of your invasives uh, but get some uh, natives planted because when you expose this, the area um, other weed seeds will come up if you don't replant.
Don, am I right that beauty berry is that bush that makes the wonderful, strongly purple berries and you get color even like in the fall and winter? That's correct. So right about now, um, they should be blooming. This one looks like it might have got eaten up by a few um, deer. So it blooms cute little pink flowers right about now. Okay. And then in the fall, they turn this bright fuchsia orange, orangish pink, just magenta maybe, magenta color. And they are edible. I did not know that. They are edible. Next time I get lost in the woods, I'll have some beauty berries. So you'll see here these two little bundles are um, covered in porcelain berry and mile a minute. These little stacks are where we planted um, natives at when we removed the invasives. And unfortunately, uh, without uh, students here this, this uh, season to help remove the invasives, um, underneath of there are some native plant material that hopefully will still be alive when we get the chance to get back and remove those uh, invasive vines. It's gone? Yeah, it's, um, this is probably another silky dogwood. It's like they're thugs. Oh. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, that's portion there. Any glimmer of anything green? Porcelain berry and mugwort. Aww. I think this was... I'm not sure. And this is basically what you guys tackle when you get the group to come in yeah, so and what help doing clear. Is we would we, we first removed all the bush honeysuckle from this area and then um, the porcelain berry from this area we removed um, and then we replant it. The challenge is that um, without chemicals, porcelain berry is really difficult to control. So this here is a great example of an area that we cleared um, there were tons of garlic mustard and there was tons of bush honeysuckle here. We cleared this area and opened it up and now we have these beautiful um, native, native seed bank that um, these flowers just came back. They were already there. We removed the invasives and then, um, and then they just came back to life. So an example of success. Bravo! <laughs>
and it's a, just a really aggressive um, invasive that people tend to have on their property and think that it's pretty because before the red berries come um, just a few weeks from now these, these will be probably cute little white flowers and then they turn a beautiful red berry in the fall okay so this here we've discovered is the remnants of a highly invasive called garlic mustard unfortunately we can't show you what the leaves look like at this time but I will tell you that if you can look here and you see back here all every single every single stem or branch that comes off of here is a seed pod and I want to show you that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So maybe ten seeds in every pod. If Look you can that. see that. So what happens is all these these seeds explode. I'm not sure why these didn't. Um uh but that's why it, that's what makes this one so aggressively invasive um, however it's one of the easiest invasives to remove you just reach down and you pull it up by the root um, and if you get them before june or july you'll get them before they seed and around that time they're easy to identify too because they have a round shaped leaf that looks something similar to gill on the ground and it'll have this stem shooting out of the top with cute little white flowers about the size of your fingernail your pinky nail so they're easy to identify some people think they're adorable but they are so aggressive um, and the other thing is is that sometimes when we have volunteers out gathering garlic mustard they will gather a bag up to take home to put in their salad because it is a edible um, invasive plant is a prime example of English ivy, another backyard weed that's really threatening our trees. Um, this this um, trunk is actually English ivy, unlike um, the bush honeysuckle, which is has this furrowed strips long ways, or um, poison ivy, which is gonna be much, much darker, almost like a chocolate um, almost black, black chocolate and much hairier. Um, so you know that it's English ivy when you have this pale like grayish the, color. That's poison ivy, right? Yep. Mm. That might be another, that could be poison ivy. I interrupted you, please go on. Um, so um, you're really safe to know you have English ivy because it's such a light color. It's always gonna have hairiness. It's gonna be hairy, uh, but nowhere near as hairy as um, a poison ivy vine would be and much, much lighter. The other thing that people don't realize about um, this English ivy is that it has several different size leaves. Um, and I'm gonna come up and show you, see if I can show you, um, they get there's even a different um, there's even a different size and shape than this, um, and that's a good one for color. Um, a pattern. So people typically recognize this guy as English ivy. So this one is a much more mature leaf, and they even get bigger and a little bit rounder than this, almost circular. And then this guy is depleted of, of um, some nutrients, so it's not getting uh, the color. Um, but these are all different English ivy um, leaves. And so in order to 
one of the really important things about removal of English ivy is that you do not want to pull it off the tree because you're really damaging the bark. And you can really pull a, a good chunks of bark when this stuff is, especially when it's this uh, severe. So what you want to do, and there's um, information on the city website about um, how to remove English ivy, but you want to get down as close to the trunk as you can, as you possibly can. And then you want to, if possible, You want to cut as low as you can to the base of the tree and then pull that piece out and away from the trunk. If you can get it out about a foot, that's, that's probably uh, where you want to. You want to pull these roots out till they're at least a foot away from the bottom of the tree. This, this stuff here will die back and in a year you won't even notice it. damage a little bit that's fine but when if you tried to pull this you could strip a whole yeah you know you could strip a whole piece right down to the cambium and then it's exposed some trees might survive it pine trees probably wouldn't um but you know some it's better to not pull it off the tree. Let's go. Oh, okay <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, and then once you got it loose, you can pull it back, like I said, about a foot, if you can. Or if it comes further. Success. Success. So the one foot is down toward the ground. Right, you want to clear it a foot away from the base of the tree, so that it takes less time for it to get back up there. Even if you just get the notch and you're unable to physically pull this out, because that took a lot. You're still going to kill everything that just all that, all the way up that tree, all that's going to die. So once you, you want to tackle every vine that you see around the base of the tree. And again, you want to keep an eye out. If it's really dark black, poison ivy, and you want to stay away from that. All right, ladies. So I guess I got a few. It's multi-flora rose. Um, and looks may be deceiving, but this multi-flora rose is, was at one time all the way out to this bench here. Wow. Um, we just cut it back last year, so this is the growth of one year. Uh, and the way that you tell multi-flora rose, uh, one, it has the white flowers in the spring, but multi-flora rose will always have downward facing thorns and then um, you can also tell multi-flora rose because it will have these hairy bracts can you see that All they're right. right here on the tips these okay. little fuzzy hairy bracts you won't see that on a regular rose bush um, so you got to be real careful because you don't want to take away a native rose but these um, mul these um, multiflora rows will grow vine-like and they can grow, I mean, they'll just keep going reaching for the light. There's n it's unending. But these guys, actually, we cut these down to the very ground when we cut them. And they were probably up this high and again, like I said, all the way out here, another three or four feet to the bench. They're monsters. And they are very tough because they are so thorny. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you use uh, gloves when you're fighting multi-flora rose. Um, and if you just want to try and get to the base of the, of the stems with a pair of loppers and then pull each one out. Um, another trick that I, that I teach the the students, when we're doing uh, removal of multiflora roses, if you go to the base of the stem and you use your hands to just gently pluck off a few of the thorns, that gives you a place to grab so that that way you're not hurting yourself when you um, grab a hold. Good point.